Welcome to another Sabbath School program. And I just want to take the opportunity to welcome those who are viewing us online. Um, the FWP Center, or Facebook. We just want to encourage you to participate in our lessons and give your feedback, your questions. We'll do as much as possible to answer those questions. We also want to welcome those who are in the audience with us. And Bible tells us where two or three are gathered, in his name, he's there to bless. And we also know that there are angels everywhere. This morning, we are tackling a very important lesson under the caption, The Crucibles That Come. And with me this morning, we have illustrious guests to add some, some meat and to add some, some, some um, better understanding as we navigate this crucible idea. We have Elder Mike Verlus with us. Welcome, Elder. Thank you for having me. We have Elder Burton with us. Elder Burton, welcome. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to everyone. Happy Sabbath. We are delighted to have you all. And to our viewers, please welcome. And we, we, with this lesson would not be the same without you. But before we start, we're going to ask Elder Verlus to give us our opening prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. We're grateful for the breath of life that we can use to live, move, and have our being and give praise, honor, and glory to you. God, the first thing that we want on our minds is you, and we're grateful that we're the first on your mind. We ask that on this blessed Sabbath morning, as we study the Sabbath school lesson that you provided for us, that your spirit may saturate our minds, and that every cloud of darkness, confusion, or whatnot may be there, may be wafted away so that the light of the Son of Righteousness may shine over our thoughts so that we may become more like Jesus. Forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elder Verlus. This morning, our lesson is under the caption, The Crucible That Come. It is interesting to know that they never said the crucible that might come. <laughs> are the crucible that may come Ella Burton it says the crucible that come seems like there is an inevitableness if you please of the crucible what, what do you get here um, Elder, Elder Burton from this topic the crucible that come and, and, and we are trying to say is it something that might come may come and is something that we need to be prepared for well, first of all, just reminding ourselves what a crucible is. A crucible is where we, you fuse physical. It's a pot where you heat and melt things together that usually don't melt together. And it takes high heat, not little low heat. The significance of it as we go into this lesson is that, as, as was spoken already, the crucibles that will come are our reaction to things is that the bottom line is that be prepared for what happens in life. Every day when you wake up, there's going to be things that will be easy and there may be some challenges. There may be emergencies, etc. So for all of us, we need to think about when these things happen, don't be so blown away. Don't be so shocked. It's part of the journey. And why I say that, because in the scripture, it talks about when you pass through the water, when you go through the fire, I am with you. So it is already letting us know that there will be those times. As, as a parent, as a teacher, you tell your children, especially when they're going away to school, that be prepared for this, be prepared for that. Like, it doesn't always go so easy, especially when you're going to the finance department. And just understand, Take your breath, move straight with faith in God, and everything will be all right. So that's my initial thought when I think of the crucible and the fact that they do come in life. If you're expecting perfection and that everything's going to be easy, you're on the wrong planet. Elder Verlis. Thank you, Elder Burton. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Elder. Um, the crucibles are really essential 
uh, for our life and for our development and for our growth. We have certain needs in life, the need for love, the need for companionship, the need for community, uh, comfort. One great need that we have is growth as well. If we're not growing, then we're dying. And uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's an interesting relationship between being comfortable and growing, where while you're growing, you're not necessarily comfortable. But the growth, just as much as the comfort, is a necessity. Right, um, but God knows how to measure uh, the amount of either growth or comfort that we need at specific times in our life, for the amount of time that we need it in our life, and He oh, He never gives us more than we can bear. And so God's objective is that we may grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. And in doing that, that means we got to go through some crucible experiences to see uh, the quality of our heart and to also see our great need of him, but also to see the hope that is found in him to become just like him. Amen, amen. You know, brothers and sisters, this morning we're talking about crucible. And when we look at the disciples, their lives were not immune from difficulties. Mm -hmm. they, they, in other words, it was their daily companion, it seems to me, that difficulties and challenges were, 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 were their lives were punctuated with difficulties and challenges. And this morning, Peter, of all the disciples, I think is uniquely qualified to speak to us about crucible. Peter had underwent many, many crucibles. And this morning, our memory verse come to us from Peter. And I want us to take a look at this. If you have your, um, your, 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 your Bible with me, with you, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. And verse 12 and 13. First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And I read in your hearing, beloved, do not think it strange, underline that word, concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice. To the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Um, Mike, yeah. here, here Peter is saying, in this Christian journey, in this path towards heaven, your life and my life, our lives, will not be immune from difficulties. And, and, and Peter is saying more so that we must have a certain type of attitude. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, how do you see that, Mike? How, what is Peter trying to say to us in the 21st century? Mm. How we should deal with this, what we call fiery mm. trials. How should we deal with that? You know, I, I firstly, I appreciate that Peter calls them fiery trials. <laughs> That he didn't just say, no, it's fine, you'll be okay, this is not a big deal. Because that's actually the type of language that's used by um, abusive people. Mm -hmm. that, no, it's okay what you're going, you'll be fine. Oh, don't make a big deal, don't be too sensitive. No, it's a real problem. It really hurts. It really affects me on the inside. It's difficult and it is challenging. It's testing my very person. You know, some people break down, have mental, mental breakdowns. They, they, it's, it, it, sometimes things can be too much. So Peter acknowledges that they are fiery trials because that's what they are. They are fiery trials. Um, but then he calls us to not think it's strange. So it's a call for your mind um, while it accepts the, 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 the quality of the trial, but also to have a different perspective on the trial. Mm -hmm. Because we never want for our sufferings to turn us into tyrants. Where I'm suffering of X, Y, and Z, and so that's why I'm rude. That's why I'm angry. That's why I can be a little bit bitter. No, God wants to cleanse all that stuff from us. So, um, so what God is doing through Peter, I believe, is he's meeting us where we are and speaking to us in a language that we can understand. Your trial is fiery. I know that it hurts you because it also hurts me. I'm there with you. But I want you to have a different perspective of that trial. I want you to look at it differently. So that's a good news, that we can look at our issues differently. And don't count it strange. I am there with you. And look, 
at the end of it all, I might be taking you through the scenic route. It might be taking a little bit of a while on this journey, um, but there is an end result that I have for you, and I just need you to trust me a little bit throughout this way. Ella Burton, when we talk about trials, we're talking about, thank you very much, Mike. We talk about trials as a, as a definition we gave. We talk about like a container, and in that container, you have different metal in the container. And, and when pressure or heat is applied to the container, different metals react differently mm -hmm. to the heat. Right. <laughs> and I think Paul, Peter is using this analogy. And the question is, how do we respond to the crucible? What kind of metal are we? I think that um, if you could just go back with Peter for a minute, um, Jesus told Peter something. Satan is going to sift you as we, as, as we. And I remember that, you know, the whole situation, Peter was upset with Jesus because Peter had a plan for Jesus that, you know, he's going to come over because he had just been praised for the saying, thou art the Christ. But then when Jesus said, this is not my kingdom, etc., Peter was very upset. And, you know, and he, and he also was upset because Jesus told him that, you know, you're going to deny me, etc. And he says, you know what, Peter, I want you to understand. You got to go through it, but when you go through it, when you are converted, so there is something that happens at the end of each test. Um, Elder, you said that the pressure, yes, the pressure of the test. <laughs> the pressure comes from the devil most times. Sometimes God, allow, well, or God allows. Right now, we know that God is holding back the winds of strife, all right? He's not let the devil have his way completely, even if you listen to the, even though when you listen to the um, news, you think that he's totally over, but God is still in control. Mm -hmm. But the point about it is when you are going through that pressure, if you don't have that hope, and that's sometimes when we go through the challenge, in fact, we are encouraged that, to give thanks when sometimes when we go through these challenges. Peter learned it a very difficult way. Mm -hmm. He denied his savior, and he saw after he denied his Savior, Jesus was passing by and their faces connected and he saw love. He saw Christ's compassion. And that's sort of what put him back together because Peter was as ripped as part almost as much as Judas was. Peter wanted to kill himself. He ran to the garden of, of, of Gethsemane, as it says in the book, Desire of Ages, and fell on the ground where Jesus was praying. But that's where he was converted. He went through that hard trial. He went through that journey of Oh my, I messed up real bad. I can't handle this anymore. And by the way, that's one of the things that happens in the crucible. In the crucible, you feel like you can't make it. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about it. And that's why, Elder, when it's mentioned fiery, mm -hmm. it's not something that feels good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give an analogy that has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. I have never had a baby. I can't have a baby. But I had a, a, a niece yesterday that was giving birth. And I prayed for her journey, mm -hmm. because the journey is not a happy, happy time. <laughs> when you're having natural childbirth, you're going through a crucible, mm -hmm. all right? And in the moment of it, sometimes you say, I can't handle this. Mm -hmm. However, however, the big conjunction, mm -hmm. when that baby comes out. Yeah. Joy. <laughs> joy. I don't know if it's perfect, perfect relaxation, but it's glad that it's over, but glad to see what has come. Mm -hmm. So the whole journey of the crucible, Remember, we've got to add that evil one into this mixture because when you ask about the metal and what kind of metals, he creates the metals that will affect us each individual. Mm -hmm. All of our temptations are not the same. Right. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is an adulterer. Not everyone is a, a, a thief. Not everyone is a gossiper. By the way, that can be a sin too. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, yeah. Each one of us has a challenge and he finds that metal. But whatever it is, he will put pressure. He'll put us in situations that will make our weaknesses come out or, in fact, try to induce our weaknesses to come out. But the hope is that we are seeing the end, not just what we're going through and knowing that God will bring us through. Mm -hmm. Peter's testimony is strong because he has been through it. Amen. So, so, so what we're gleaming here, Mike, is that Crucible, challenges, tests, difficulties must be expected by the Christian. In other words, and if you expect something, it seems, <laughs> it, it, it seems, Brother Glenn, if you expect something, it seems like your attitude may be different. And it, 
I want to transition now to Sunday about surprises. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you saw where I was going. Okay. You know, there are some elements of surprises that are still good. Maybe when Mike popped the question, right? That surprises her, but it's a good surprise. <laughs> when, <laughs> so it's a good surprise, you know? Uh, a birthday um, gift that you did not expect, a good surprise. Uh, any other surprises? Maybe a friend you have not seen. You know, I just re was reconnected to a friend I have not seen for 40 years. And for some reason through YouTube, he, he saw Watson and he, he reached out to the person and said, are you Dal Dalbert? Um, and the person said, no, I'm his brother. And through that, there was a connection. And that was a good surprise. I'm sure you have many good surprises in your life. But here Paul is talking about another surprise, Mike. And for Christian, he's saying that this one, we should, we should not be surprised. How should we deal with the, 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 the aspect? Why would a Christian be surprised about challenge? Why? You know, because there is a mindset that we can have, which is that if I follow the law to the letter, everything's going to be all right. Mm. You know, if I if I you know follow the rules, I do everything as I'm supposed to do 100. Mm. I I eat very very healthy. You know, I I eat raw. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> I eat raw. You know, I'm I'm just going to like the extreme of per, of quote unquote perfection, but then after that, you 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 deal with a consequence that you wouldn't have expected to deal with because you quote unquote did the right thing. You know, and so now you're shocked. You're admitting, well, how could this happen to me? Mm -hmm. I was doing what I should have been doing. I was, and then you keep on talking all, about all the things that you have done, uh, not realizing, look, I think I might have an eye problem, right? And, and, and we miss the fact that, look, the, the, the trials that come, it is God allowing it for his reason. I mean, we'll get into that a little mm -hmm, bit more. Mm -hmm. But you think of people like Job, for example, mm -hmm. right, who went through so much. It wasn't because of anything wrong that he did, mm -hmm. but rather, if anything, it was because of the right mm -hmm. thing that he did, <laughs> exactly. right? And then yep. at the end, God said, Job said of me that which was right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that we tend to get surprised because like children, for example, you know, parents will tell them, look, go to school, get an education, do this, do that, do this, do that. And then when you get a certain age, things are gonna work out for you. And then when, you get, when they get that certain age, things are not working <laughs> out for them. And they look at their parents, say, wait a minute, what's going on? Exactly. You know, um, and, and it's to understand that there's a little bit more behind just following rules without understanding. There's something deeper that God wants us to see. Um, and so he allows the problems, the surprises, so that we can shift our focus to the lesson that he wants to teach us and to the experience that he wants us to have. Great point. You know, um, if I could I, just add something, ahead. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If I could add something also, I think it's very important to understand that we have an enemy. Yeah. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now I say that right now in, this, in, in the political world right now, we, we have this situation with that young lady who played basketball and she's been in Russia for seven times, seven years. So what she had been going through, I'm sure this is not the first time she brought whatever she brought with her, but because of the situation going on between our country and her country, she can be used as a pawn right. in a very serious thing. So, when she passed through that whatever and they found what they found, now she's going through trial, she's going through tribulations that, she, this is a lady who was a star over there, mm -hmm. all right, much bigger than here. But all of a sudden now, she's in a crucible, you know, she wrote a letter to the president and said, I don't think I'm ever coming out of here. That's something that she could not ever expect. I think that when those type of things happen, like you said, you do, do everything right to get a job and you think it's going to open up and all of a sudden at the last minute you don't get the job. What happens? What happens if all of your, and I can testify to this, I had a close friend, good health. Much better, you know, as he'd be there at the gym and everything, do all the stuff that he had to do. And he kept telling me, you know, I feel something in my, my, my chest that doesn't feel right. He went to the doctor, elder, seven weeks later he was dead. Mm, mm. All right, left the wife, 
left three children. Mm. Life all changed, just in something that was not expected. Mm. That was a crucible for the church, all right, because he was an elder in our church, very prominent. Mm. And it just threw everybody off because we did not see it coming. It's not so much that God's saying, okay, I'm going to let him die right now. We have an enemy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the enemy is the one who comes and puts his ingredients in it. To, uh, and if we clearly do not understand that, when these surprises come, because yeah. as you're right, they still will come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, and you know what? No matter how much we can talk up here, mm -hmm. if we go out, God forbid, we don't know if we make it to our car. Mm -hmm. All right? Those are the type of surprises that can knock you over. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it, again, is, and we'll get to it by the end of the lesson, I guess, if I stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I see that we have um, many people watching us. We, we, we still would like you to participate by sharing your idea about the lesson. Uh, if you have any questions. We also have a mic. Um, in, right in the center of the church, and I see Brother Glenn hand is up. We'll take your question, Brother Glenn. Uh, Brother Glenn, you said that uh, there's this thing about surprises. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible says, in all thy ways acknowledge him, mm -hmm. and he shall direct thy path. Mm -hmm. So, as Christians, God, if we believe God directs our path, mm -hmm. And if we have this working relationship with God, um, then we should not be surprised at anything. Mm -hmm. Because if, if God is directing, if we are in the palm of his hands, just like how he has a sea in the palm of his hands, mm -hmm. then whatever happens to us, he allows it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, like Job, we should still praise him no matter what. Mm -hmm. So we should not be surprised of anything. Uh, I think I told Brother well, Watson a, a little situation uh, about um, Victory Lake. Mm -hmm. Well, as many of you probably know, I was doing, the, uh, should I say, I'm doing the uh, air conditioning system at the Victory Lake camp. And so initially I said to the president, I said, man, listen, the, uh, the units, according to the manufacturer, will not be delivered in time for the, uh, the camp meeting. So I said to him, the only alternative we have is to pray. <laughs> That's what I said to him. Amen. And he said to me, um, you know, maybe we should rent something. And I said to him, well, you know, that's not how faith works. <laughs> and I was about to get into the, <laughs> the whole concept of faith with him. But then he said to me, all right, tell you what, rent what? So, you know, be, he being the president, I, 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 I decided to, to listen. So the morning I went onto the website to rent the equipment, and the voice said to me, didn't you pray about this? So why are you trying to rent it now? So I closed the internet and went about my business, believing that God would deliver. Amen. And uh, to make a long story short, I went, he said to me, if I rent anything, so I, rent, I went back and I made a reservation for the thing. And so a week or two later, the company called me and said, your delivery will be Monday. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's it, that's a week before the camp meeting. <laughs> and I said, man, I gotta go back to apologize to God. <laughs> Seriously, because I believe in my whole heart that God would have come through. Mm. But because, well, he was a president, you know, I couldn't really defy <laughs> the guy who was employing me. So I, I, I went, but all of this I'm trying to say is, I even said to, the, to one of the guys at the manufacturer, you know, I believe my unit is going to be on the priority list. That's mm -hmm. what I said to the guy. And the last piece of equipment that was put into the unit was put in, in June 14th. Wow. And so we got the equipment on time. So I'm trying to say in all of this, that God directs our path. Mm -hmm. So anything that designs, is designed to happen to us, God already knew about it mm -hmm. long before we even thought about it. Or before it happened to us. Amen. So when, when God comes to us and gives us quote unquote surprises, then we, all we should say is thank you, Jesus, because it, it is in our path, it, it is in our lineage, it is in our structure, and it is in, in every direction of our entirety. Just remember and, that. And we're going to take, we're going to take the, uh, and, and what you're saying here, Brother Glenn, it is for our own good. Mm. 
right? It's for our growth and it's also for our development. Yes, my brother. Welcome. Hi, Stuart. Matt. I, I, I just wanted to say something that I got from, from Elder Burris's comments about attitude mm -hmm. being the key. There's a, there's a, a, a saying that life, uh, success in life is 10% aptitude, 90% mm -hmm. attitude. Amen. Amen. That's, that's what Very I powerful think. statements. And I think Paul is trying to help us with our attitude. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so that's a very insightful um, comment here. Our attitude. I know, Elder Mike, you want to? Yeah, I was going to quickly read something. And I really appreciate what the elder said. Because, yes. you know, it's not just about attaining success, but the kind of person that you're becoming as you're getting there. That's what this is about. I've read this statement. I wanted to share with everybody because it was so special to me. It says, frequently the very best evidence that we can have that we are in the right way is that the is that the least advance costs us effort and that darkness shrouds our path mm -hmm. it has been my experience that the loftiest heights of faith we can only reach through darkness and clouds mm. So some of the greatest evidences that we could have that we are on the path with God are the challenges and difficulties that we're going that we are growing through, not just going going through. Mm. Right, things don't just happen to us. Trials don't just happen to us. In changing our mindset, we can get something out of it, and and I think that's what God wants us to do. Amen. Mm. You know, it was William Penn who wrote, "No pain, no palm. No thorns, no crown." No gall, no glory. No cross, no crown. Hmm. Oh, I just want to say something there, too. <laughs> well, you know, because it's very serious. I know our time is. Um, everything that people are saying is correct. And at the same time, it doesn't solve the problem in the true sense of the word. Because if you walk to, especially with young people today, young people have questions about everything. And they're challenging whether or not there's God. All right, And with all the things that we see, because I was telling somebody the other day, when we watch the news, the one thing that we can expect, or not expect from this, the news, is to praise God. What the news will do is tell you everything that's wrong. And, that, and that's why sometimes we should not watch the news as much. But the news tells you everything that's wrong. That's how they make money. They don't make money about, oh, it's a glorious day, the sun is shining, so and so, so. So the news doesn't testify of God. And the reason I say that is when we deal with a crucible type of situation, and I'm briefly a friend of mine, she called me yesterday. This lady lost her daughter about six years ago to cancer, okay? Her second son came back from the war, and you know, he was over in the Afghanistan area, and he had, what is that, post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. and he just messing up, messing up, in and out of different um, um, institutions. She dealt with, dealt with that. He has a twin brother. The twin brother now got involved with drugs, all right? And actually was actually stealing stuff from the mother's house, et cetera, et cetera. She has one other daughter left, all right? And that daughter is supposed to be what she considers to be, the one who handles things right, et cetera. She called me yesterday and says, Arnold, my daughter had a nervous breakdown. So. All four of her children have gone in a way. Now, Elder, mm -hmm. I have to speak to this lady now. Mm -hmm. I can't just tell her, don't worry, it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. I can't just tell her it's God's will. Mm -hmm. Because she doesn't want to hear that right now. Right. She wants to hear something that is going to get her through that pain. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, as Christians, in, in talking about crucible and surprise, that's the thing that has to be understood. In these last days, are, real, are we really ready for the surprises that not only God has for us, but for the evil one has for us? Because if we're not, we're, it's going to be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. it, what do you say to that person? that's going through that type of situation. Sometimes the best thing to do is sit and listen. Okay. It's Amen. to sit and listen, not to try to come up with a solution right then and there, because that's not the time. Okay. The time is silent prayer, just comfort, I'll, I'm there for you if you need me, mm -hmm. and wait on the grace of God. Because Amen. in the crucible, the only one who really solves the problem is God. Yes. And it's in his time. And by the way, sometimes we don't get the answer that we want. Absolutely. So, so. Very good point. Um, 
very, very great point. I think one of the things that we are trying to bring out, and I hope we are tr getting out, is that we need to change our theology. Because if your theology is wrong, it can make your crucible <laughs> multiply in its effect. In other words, if you expect something that God did not promise, imagine what that can do to your theology. What can that do to your Christianity? If you expect Christianity to be a bed of rules, which was never promised, imagine when trial comes. And here Paul, Peter is helping us to understand we need to change that way of thinking. And we need to understand that while we're living in this great controversy between what? Good and evil. There are going to be what? Challenges. There are going to be difficulty. And none of us is immune. I don't care how, how well you eat. I don't care how long you pray. I don't care how long you have been in the church. You and I are not immune. I think that's what Paul is saying. Peter is saying, and we must expect things bad to happen to us. And finally, I would say, before I jump on to uh, Monday, brothers and sisters, this was not a part of the original plan. Mm -hmm. Can you say amen? amen. And because it, is, it was not a part of the original plan, it will not last forever. Amen. Amen. We could stop here. Yeah. It is not going to last forever. But mm -hmm. since we can't stop here, we're going to jump on to Monday. Mike, according to 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 to 11, he, Peter is saying, we are learning that one of the major causes of suffering in this world is because of Satan. One of the major causes of suffering is because of Satan. And I want to invite us to turn our Bibles to 1 Peter 5, 8. I know that's a very familiar scripture for many of us. All right. Right? 1 Peter 5. And verse 8. Yes. And I read in your hearing. He said, be what? Sober. Be so why? why? Why should I be sober? Mm. Mm. He said, be vigilant. Why should we be vigilant? Mm. Can, we, can we get the why? Mm. Because your adversary, the devil, walks As walks mm -hmm. <laughs> about like what? A roaring lion seeking mm -hmm. whom he may devour. Right. Mike, yeah. question to you. Mm -hmm. Brother Burton. It seems that there is a, com a, a, a comparison here with the lion and Satan, but there is also an interesting comparison with the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes, sir. So there seem to be mm -hmm. two characteristics that are depicted here mm -hmm. by a lion. Mm -hmm. Mike, maybe talk about this lion, yes. which is roaring, <laughs> and maybe yeah. Ella Burton wants to talk about the, the, the other lion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we see the, 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 the contrast mm -hmm. between the lion that roars mm -hmm. And this lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. This lion here that Peter, the apostle Peter is speaking about, um, we need to be sober against him, meaning our minds need to be right and aware of the enemy and his devices. Um, we need to be vigilant um, of the things that he may do to cause us to slip and to fall. Um, and understand that he's out to get us. He's out for keeps. He mm. wants us dead in our sins. Okay, he want, and that, that's the purpose of persecution. Like in the dark ages, the devil through the papacy, through the church in that day, was working to destroy the people of God in their sin. That, that was the objective um, of the enemy of all souls. So, so, so he's as a roaring lion. Lions will roar to threaten, to cause fear in the hearts of, of their prey. And he's walking about seeking whom he may devour. He's always looking after us. But... As you just mentioned, Elder Watson, about the lion of the tri tribe of Judah, while the devil is seeking whom he may destroy, the lion of the tribe of Judah is seeking whom he may restore. Mm. He's seeking the lost, not to destroy, but to save. Mm -hmm. The devil is seeking to destroy and end us for eternity. So um, the devil always has a counterfeit against what God has. And the good news is that what God has as, as being our lion, our backup, is to heal, to protect, and to keep us safe from the enemy and all of his devices. So we need to be awake. When the Bible calls us to watch and pray, mm. right, if we're, if we're only praying, then we're eventually going to fall asleep. It says to watch as well. But if we're only watching, then we're going to end up wandering after the beast. Mm -hmm. So we have to do both. We have to watch and pray and stay close to God, stay closely connected to God so that whatever we're going through, all the things that the devil may be doing, 
if we're close to God, then he will be that line behind us seeking to keep us safe and to deliver us from any evil that comes our way. Amen. Ella, Ella Burton, pick up here. Help us out to understand these two different uh, metaphors for the lion. <laughs> well, I'm going to say, help me, Holy Spirit. The, the thing that, you know, I'm ready to go. Because one of the things that we all need to remember, and I, I say this not only to the young people, because older people, seniors, there's one thing that we have, a weapon, that we can use, and it's the word of God. Amen. All right? And the Bible says, to study, to show thyself approved, the work which need not be ashamed, rightly, and rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. As was mentioned, the devil is a counterfeit. Everything he does is a counterfeit, a deception. The roaring lion, to make it seem like, well, you know, this is going to come and get us. But the Lion of Judah Amen. is my savior. Right. The Lion of Judah died on Calvary's cross. Right. He lived a perfect life yeah. and that life is made for me yeah. to grab onto mm -hmm. for the weakness that I have. Mm -hmm. The Lion of Judah is the one that is going to save us and get us through. Yeah. So that's why it says at the end of the lesson, it says, but may, this is first, I'm not the end of that, that, that portion. Mm -hmm. It says first Peter 5, 10, mm -hmm. but may the God of all grace yeah. mm -hmm. who called us to his eternal glory by Christ. the Lion of Judah, That's Jesus right. Christ. Mm. After you have suffered a while, hold on, mm -hmm. we will go through suffering. Mm -hmm. He says, but what will happen? Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Mm -hmm. So the Lion of Judah will come and do what we can't do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you are making the comparison, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's none. There's none. There's Amen. none. Because Amen. my Jesus has taken care of everything. But it's the point and the question I have to ask myself. Arnold Burton, do you know Jesus? Yes, mm. that's the question. Do you know him as your lion? Mm. Mm. Or are you looking at the other lion chasing you mm. and worried so much about looking at chasing, not realizing the real lion has already taken care of the problem? Yes, yes. Amen. What a, what, a, what a powerful analogy. You know, it, it brings to my mind John 10 and verse 10. He says that the devil comes to what? Yeah. To kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's what the lion does, right? In this metaphor, right? Because he's roaring and he's trying to destroy. But there is another lion. But Jesus said, but I have come. The, that's the comparison, right? Uh, the contrast, if you please. I have come that they might have what? Have life. And not only life, but abundant life. Right? So we uh, can have this assurance. I, I, I just want to acknowledge our online um, viewers. I see Sister, Sister Angela says, Happy Sabbath, brethren. Let me say that crucibles are rough. And we say amen for that. But has a purpose. Yes. Bible says, those that the Lord love, it chases. It, there's a purpose. And the purpose is what? For us to grow, Mike said, and develop into the person that God would have us to be. Can you say amen? amen. And, and so we have other comments. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know that, look about Joseph we studied the other day. Before Joseph was exalted, he, had, he suffered. Oh, Isn't that true? Yes. He went through a lot. But in the end, he was what? He was exalted. Became what? Second in charge in Egypt. Look at David. Running, hiding. And then became what? King. Look at our Savior Jesus. Mm -hmm. Suffered much. But at the end he was exalted. These are forerunners for us. So in our trials and our difficulties, let us not focus on the trials. Let us focus on him who is able to take us through brothers and sisters. Right? So the, the news is the lion that roars is a defeated lion. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> right? Victory is already won through Jesus Christ. And if we are in Christ, Paul says, we are what? New creatures. Right? And so we can experience victory. I know our time is running. So let's jump and talk about the crucible of Satan and the crucible of sin. You will re recognize, Sister Desire, that before sin, Eden was perfect. Yes. Everything moves to the beat of the heart of God. There was, there was synergy 
and earth and in heaven. But when sin came in, the Bible says that God said to them, in the day you sin, what happened? You will surely die. You will surely die. Things are going to be different. Yeah, yeah. And there were what? Consequences. Indeed. And what we are learning, some of the things that we are going through, is a direct result of sin. You want to talk about that, Mike? Yes, I think that this is very important to talk about because this, this goes directly to the character, the quality of the character of God that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, when God said, you will surely die, mm -hmm. um, that's something to really understand. What does that mean? What, what Adam understood was that after he sinned, what Adam understood was that when God is now going to be coming for me, he's coming to kill me. <laughs> that, that's what Adam understood. Why? Because he had a wrong picture of God in his mind. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that picture of God, that when I do something wrong, God is going to, he's, he's out to get me, mm. uh, to burn me for, eternity. not for, <laughs> but, but, but some of us are more learned, right? We say, no, not for eternity, but for an adequate period of time until he is satisfied inside. Mm. And then after that, he executes us, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, that, that concept is just as bad. When God came to Adam and Adam was afraid, God had to explain to Adam, look, the problem is not that you're going to die. The problem is that you're dying. Hmm. You did something mm -hmm. that is causing you to decay. And what I've done is I've encircled this world that you're in right now by an atmosphere of grace. And I put the results of sin in slow motion. We're told it's about 6,000 years <laughs> Gradual, eh? that we're at right now. Okay, so, so the results of sin has been uh, put in slow motion right now. There should have been immediate, I, I think, I suggest, immediate annihilation. Once sin, boom, there should have been destruction. But God slowed things down so that we can see its results, so that we can make up our mind to be on his side and to be sealed on his side. Mm -hmm. right? so, so I think that what went on early on in the beginning was the perversion of the picture of who God is mm -hmm. by the enemy of all souls. Which, so that's the misrepresenting, mm -hmm. misrepresentation of God's character, mm -hmm. which happens in the mind of Adam, which now leads him to sin and not even know that he's in sin. Mm -hmm. God has to reveal that to him and to reveal to him, look, I'm here now to save you. I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. You don't go to a doctor and then the doctor says, oh, you have this disease and I'm going to kill you because you have it. You know, no, you, the, the doctor is there to heal you. But if you don't take his advice, hmm. the medication, the, the tips that he gives you, then the natural result of your going against his uh, uh, suggestions mm -hmm. is going to be your death. I see our time is fleeting away. Um, we we, we want to, I want us to just take a quick look at Romans 1.18. He said, for the wrath of God, you know, and when we read that, I don't know what conjecture you have in your mind of who God is. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath, when you, when you hear the wrath of God, Elder Burton, what, how, how do I explain it to those who are viewing us and, and, and this beautiful audience in front of us? The wrath of God. Is God sitting up in heaven? Can't wait for the opportunity, Elder Jackson, to just hit me in the head, to punish me. It's just God sit there, just can't wait for me to mess up Sister Alvaranga that, so that he can punish me. Is that, is, that, is that the type of God that we serve? What that's, is this wrath of God? That's not God. <laughs> that is a... One of the things that, and to tie in with this, when Adam sinned, that's the first time he knew fear. He wasn't afraid of God. He, no. There was no need to be afraid of God. He didn't even know what fear was. Mm -hmm. Fear is a suggestion of the devil. The devil whispered, oh, God is coming. You better be back, back, because he's going to get you. He's going to get you. Adam never had that relationship with, with, with God. He had, him and Eve were there, and they never worried. But going to... The, the point about wrath, it's the wrong word, mm -hmm. all right? <laughs> it's the wrong phrase. Mm -hmm. The wrath of God, God at this point, when he's not that he is planning to do something, he lets the consequences happen, mm -hmm. all right? The wrath of God is allowing the consequences mm -hmm. of, that we make, mm -hmm. that we bring upon us to come. Mm -hmm. The consequence of disobeying God, disobeying God was death but death in a way that they did not understand. The wrath of God sometimes allows, God sometimes allows us for our benefit mm. to learn a lesson from something that we did that was not good for us, mm. all right? 
Many people who have sickness from eating the wrong stuff or drinking the wrong stuff, and then later on the doctor says, you know, this is a cause because you've been eating certain things or you haven't, and he's, oh, I never thought about that. And then you realize, well, maybe God was trying to teach me. I'm glad I'm still alive to understand and make a change. Mm -hmm. The wrath of God, and it's a very, very important point because the world is focusing on it as if it is God being so angry and mm -hmm. God's gonna get you mm -hmm. and God hates you. Right. And that's why a lot of people are turning away from, from the church, church. Mm -hmm. all right? And not just young people. In fact, I think young people will run to the church more than the old people, hmm. all right? Because it's not just something to hold the Bible and read it, it's do you believe it? Do you understand it? But so when we see those terms, and sometimes we as Christians, we love to jump onto those terms as if I want God to get them. <laughs> you know, sometimes, uh, you ever been in a conversation and you're talking about something that somebody did, did something and the person says, oh, don't worry, God's going to take care of them. Mm. Mm. God's going to take, you should never say that. Mm. If God's going to take care of them, God's going to save them. That's, that's what he God's takes care of. That's what he takes care of. God's <laughs> job, oh my, God's job is not to make us be lost. Yeah. It says God sent not the, his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. So, so Amen. understanding the word wrath, it's really digging in your scripture yeah. and, and going through all the phrases and you'll start to see that wrath doesn't mean what you think it does. Right, right. God's not coming with joy to get the wicked. Yeah. He's coming to get his children right. mm. to save them. I, I wish we had time to elaborate on this lesson. But eventually what, what this wrath of God is, as I understand it, Mike, is God giving us up because we refuse to listen. He said, oh, Israel, why will you suffer? Yeah. How much I want to have you under my wings. And sometimes God comes to the point, and we're going to get into that hopefully the next lesson, where God says, you know what, Israel, I don't know what else to do. Mm, mm, mm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you hit your nose. Mm. And sometimes as parents, <laughs> and sometimes as parents, we do everything to protect our children. And at the time, we're going to have to say, you know what, I'm going to have to make you hit your, buck your foot. Mm. Because there's nothing else I can do. Do I have a witness in here this morning? Somebody say yes, hey amen. Sometimes you have done everything and you have to say, okay, honey, I'm going to have to make you hit your nose. Mm -hmm. And sometimes God has to take that stand. I, I, I know we don't have enough time. I see so, brothers and sisters, if you have a point, I sure you have a point. Because the truth is we all go through crucibles. Mm -hmm. What have you learned through your crucibles that you would like to share with me who is going through my crucible now? Are those who are viewing and that you want to encourage them? Anybody? The mic is there. Please feel free. Tell us how you overcame. Sure we all I, 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 and I see what time is running. Anyway, let's jump on to Wednesday lesson. Talk about crucible of purification. Mm -hmm. There's only need for purification if there, is, if there are impurities. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you don't need to be purified if you, are, if you all have it together. If you're already righteous, why do you need to be purified? Purified Purification implies that there are impurities in our lives that need to be made right. And it seems to me, Elder Burton, that crucibles is a means of purification. How does that work? Well, the same thing as we talked about what the crucible is. You're pouring the metal and you're, you're purifying the metal. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the, the Bible says, for he is like a refiner's fire. All right, he takes and he cleans out all the dross. Sometimes when you're, you have the metal gold, and the gold doesn't just look perfect when it's taken out of the ground. It has other metals that are connected to it. And when in the purification process, all the impurities are removed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is what God, in our, through our experiences, allows to happen to us, for us to lean on him, to, to, to call on his name. That's when impurity is being removed. Every time we call on the name of Jesus, an impurity is being made. Every time we say, Lord, I trust you, even though I'm going through a difficult time, that's when the impurities are being removed. As long as we keep doing that and going in that direction, we're becoming more and more refined. But if we fall back, sometimes the dirt falls back on us, and we've got to review what got us to that point and move away from it by the grace of God. Brother Mike, speak about this purification um, crucible because it seems to me it's an important element yeah. 
of the Christian journey. Yes. Because the Bible says all have sinned, right? Yes. And have come short mm. of the glory of God. So mm. if all have sinned, mm. then all need purification. That's right. That's uh, right. And crucible seem to be mm. that means mm. are one of the means of purification. That's right. It's I think of like sandpaper when you use it to like sand down some wood <laughs> to get it smooth and mm -hmm. whatnot. It's to remove those little extra edges. Mm -hmm. You know, that purification process, it, it doesn't feel good. It is painful, but it's it's it the the, the trials of our life are God's servants. They're God's workmen to purify us and to perfect us into the image of Christ. When we think about Christ, um, the Bible says that uh, Christ was made perfect through obedience, mm -hmm. right? Now, it's not that there was any impurity in him. There was mm -hmm. not. He was perfect, mm -hmm. but he went through the same process as we did. But um, what, what, what turned out... What turns out is that um, there was perfection in him. There was no impurity. So that now if he dwells in us while we go through the same thing, mm -hmm. Well, we continue through our purification process. All those things that are in us will be removed so long as Christ is within. I just want to give one quick little point about the wrath of God because God wants to remove wrath from us. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says that um, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. So his wrath is completely diametrically opposed to ours. Mm -hmm. his, our wrath is if I'm angry at somebody, I go to them and I beat them up type of thing. But with God, as you said, Elder, he backs away. There was nobody in this world. Listen carefully. There's nobody in in this universe who suffered the wrath of God to the degree that Jesus suffered it on the cross of Calvary. And what happened? Jesus said, Father, Father, why hast no, thou forsaken, forsaken me? me? So when we go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59, you don't have to go there, but rather it's Isaiah 54 mm -hmm. and verse 8. There, there it talks about what the wrath of God is and it explains that in a little mercy I turn away turn from away. you. Mm -hmm. So that's the wrath of God. And it's important for us to understand that because in the third angel's message, it talks about the wrath of God. And we who are to preach that message need to do it clearly and not scare people to death mm -hmm. with that message, but rather show that it's a message of life and of God respecting our decision to either be on his side or remain on our own. If we're on his side, then he will purify us and make us just like the lamb mm -hmm. who is on Mount Zion in Revelation 14. I hope we made that clear. Mm -hmm. The wrath of God is basically God stepping back and say, okay, have your way. And reap what you have sown. <laughs> That's the wrath of God. It's not that God sitting there just waiting for the opportunity to punish. I say what time? Eh? That doesn't make God sow. No, not at all. It's, it takes more power. <laughs> and reap what you sowed isn't the end. Mm -hmm. until, until the final wrath of God comes when Jesus comes after. Reap what you sow now so I can save you. Mm. I see, see that you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And let me pick you up and help you get back on the track. So sometimes the wrath of God is to teach us something that can hopefully eventually save us. I see I'm getting the wrap-up sign. Yes. And we are having so much fun. We just want to thank our viewers. I see Sister Benson there. Give a shout out to Sister Benson. And I see some Lorraine and others um, who are viewing us. So we look at some of the causes of the crucibles. We look at sin. We look at, 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 at Satan. Right? We also want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that there is also maturity yeah. as a result of crucible. And maturity in, implies that there is what? Growth. Sister Kenesha, it talks about what? Growth. It talks about um, changes that take place in one's life as a result of crucible. So it's implying here, Mike, that there is a positive side <laughs> we might be emphasizing that, but there is also a positive side to crucible. How would you, um, and you know, as we, as, we, as we deal with this crucible maturity, I guess we could try to do the wrapping up here because I, I, we don't have much time, unfortunately. It, it, it's definitely very, very difficult, but <laughs> I, I, oh, it, <laughs> No, no. Go ahead. So what I would so what I would say in regards to the maturity, um, it's what it's it's that word growth that we use. I think about the children of Israel there when they were at the foot of Mount Zion, uh, not Mount Zion, pardon me, but Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. and God was speaking in loud thunderous tones. He had to speak to them that way because they were as children, mm -hmm. immature. But that's the only way that He could reach them. But what God wants us to do is no longer stay at the foot of the mountain, but to mature and go up to the Mom. summit of the mountain, Mount Zion, <laughs> where we find the 144,000 exactly. who have the understanding of God and who He is, so that we can be settled in the the truth both intellectually and spiritually whereby we cannot be moved by his grace amen mm -hmm. hello i think that the the because of time but i'm going to leave this the effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much mm -hmm. in order to get through anything you have to have a relationship with god where you're communicating with him mm -hmm. and, and to handle any crucible 
you must have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So wherever you are, how old you are, young you are, whatever, the thing is to work on your relationship with God mm -hmm. and that will get you through all the crucibles of life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for viewing, for listening. Here Paul talks about God allowing a crucible in his life mm -hmm. to keep him humble, mm -hmm. to keep him from falling away. And sometimes the difficulties that we face could very well be the means of saving us. It's God's way of keeping us humble. It's God's ways of keeping us on the path of righteousness. So brothers and sisters, whatever we're going through, I just want to encourage us to remain faithful. Because this is not the end. The victory is already won. The victory is won through Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And if we die to our sins, we can also be raised to walk in the newness of life. Not, 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 not next year, but today. Amen. Bible says, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Amen. This has brought us to the end of our Sabbath school. As you notice that our, 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 our resident host was not here today, and he will be back next week. Thank you for viewing. Do have a happy Sabbath. Divine service starts with Dr. Sean Dowden. Happy Sabbath. Amen. Church and happy Sabbath. Sabbath. To our in-person and online congregation, and on behalf of Pastor Sean Dowding, welcome to First Seven Day Adventist Church of White Plains. And we hope and pray that you will be blessed by today's service and fellowship. I will begin today's announcements, starting with birthdays. On July 12th, we have Maxine Hall. And July 15th, we have Lloydine Jacobs and Sister Madge Jacob. Happy birthday to all of you, and God bless. For our Sabbath afternoon and evening programs, just want to remind everyone that the early teen room will be open for anyone in need of special prayer. The early teen room will be open directly after divine worship, and that room is located right by the stairs. Children's Sabbath School for Cradle Roll and Kindergarten will be at 1 p.m. this afternoon via Zoom. 
and Bible class will be at 4 p.m. AYM is not? No AYM. No Bible class, sorry, okay. So we will not have Bible class today, my apologies. AYM will be at 5 p.m. today. Please keep in mind that the first and second Sabbaths are for the church at large and everyone's invited to attend. Third Sabbaths are for youths only and fourth and fifth Sabbaths, there is nothing scheduled. Pathfinder will be at 6 p.m. and will continue to alternate on Saturdays. Please note that Adventurous Club meeting is canceled for this week and we will notify you when the meetings will start up again. For Save the Dates and upcoming events, the Northeastern Conference's AYM and Religious Liberty Departments are sponsoring a trip to Washington, D.C. for youths ages 14 to young adult. The trip will take place on Wednesday, July 13th and includes a tour of the Capitol and a visit to the African American Museum as well as the Martin Luther King Memorial. A light breakfast will be provided and this is an opportunity to also speak with congressional leaders. So the cost is $15 per person and if you would like to purchase tickets, I believe there's still space available, you can go to store.necyouth.org to register. Youth Day and Gospel Concert will be on July 16th with guest speaker, Pastor McDonald. Please make sure you bring a friend. The Senior and New Believers Banquet will be on July 17th and is being held at Anton's Catering Hall in Queens. The cost, if you would like to attend, is $70 for seniors and $75 for everyone else. Vacation Bible School, uh, the dates have been adjusted, so it will be from July 18th through July 21st at 6.30 p.m. in person. Please contact the phone number for more information if you would like to attend. Our annual church picnic will be on July 31st, starting at 11 a.m. at Secker Woods Park in Hartsdale. This will be a day of fun and games and for the whole family. So we hope you can all attend. For ongoing events, Teen Sabbath School is now meeting at 8 p.m. on Fridays via Zoom. Lessons may be found on Cornerstone Connects Dot net. Adult Sabbath School, just a reminder for those of you just coming or maybe you're not aware, Adult Sabbath School is at 10 a.m. in the mornings, in person, and via YouTube. Primary and Junior Sabbath School is at 10 p.m. in the mornings via Zoom. And our food pantry distribution continues on Thursday afternoons from 1 to 3 p.m. and Saturday evenings from 9.30 to 10 p.m. All are welcome. For our prayer and fasting schedule, we want to remind everyone of the prayer and fasting schedule. There are prayer lines for you to call during the week. And just a reminder that our Wednesday night prayer meeting is at 730. And we also have tips for fasting. We also want to invite you to record your testimony. If you would like to share your testimony, please record a two to three minute video or contact Elder Adrian Alvarenga for help or support. For clerk's announcements, I do want to remind everyone uh, for our board members and department heads that meetings will recommence in September with the new pastor. So we will confirm those dates when a new pastor joins. And for anyone that received the pastor envelopes from Sister Clark, uh, please return them to her if you have misplaced them or if you would like to receive one. She's sitting right up here in the front. So please, uh, please give her uh, the envelopes or let her know if you would like one. We've had um, a few passings, so I do want to make announcements for those funeral arrangements. So arrangements have been made for Pastor Willard Hall. The memorial service will be at Willard E. Latimer Sun Funeral Home on Tuesday, July 12th from 5 to 8 p.m. And the funeral will be held on Sunday, July 12th at Linden SDA Church in Mount Laurel. I'm sorry, in Laurel, Laurelton, New York. And the funeral for Donald Burke will be held at New Hope SDA Church in Georgia on July 24th at 10 a.m. 
please make sure you are taking a look at the Sabbath lineup that has been emailed to everyone and posted in the FWP chat for any other events or announcements that I may have missed. Divine worship begins now with Pastor Richardson as our guest speaker, so please prepare your hearts and minds for worship. And I'm sorry, I did forgot, forget that Elder, um, Elder Webb does have a few announcements that he's going to make first. God bless. Thank you, Sister Patrice, and good morning, church. Okay. Thank you, Sister Patrice, and good morning, church. Good morning. Praise God. You know, David says in Psalm 103. Anybody remember what he says there? Psalm 103, verse 1. Who remembers that? No. Psalms 103 and verse 1. Nobody remembers that one there? Let me refresh your mind then. Bless the Lord and all that is within me. So that was just a trial run, right? Let's go now. Bless the Lord and all that is within me. Amen. And praise God for the Sabbath day. You know, um, I was a little bit um, sad earlier on in the week because it appears that we would not have had this kind of setting this morning. And I was feeling sad about it. But where's Brother Rocky? He spoke this morning about um, praying instead of hoping. And um, does just show you what prayer can, can, can do. Let me see hands of those who are feeling comfortable inside this morning. Comfortable within yourself, comfortable within the place. Everybody seems to be comfortable, isn't that so? And that's what we're praying for, that we'd be comfortable in the house of God this morning. And thank God we are. Now I'm going to quickly share with you a couple of things, um, a few things, sorry. On next Sabbath, there'll be quite um, a level of activity going on in this place. We'll have the happy privilege of um, receiving our homegrown um, pastor speaking to us on that Sabbath, Pastor Lawrence McDonald. It will also be the Sabbath when we will say our farewell to Pastor Dowding and his family as they transition to his new post, his new calling, his new area. There'll be a baptism next week, Sabbath also. And... Um, the candidates, I'm not sure if they are here, but if you are here, we'd like to meet with you prior to next week's Sabbath morning. There'll also be baby blessings, and there might be other activities. Nonetheless, we are looking forward to a happy Sabbath, a blessed Sabbath, but a full, I mean, filled day next week's Sabbath. Each department, I'd like to encourage you, each department, to please avail yourself and prepare yourself accordingly. It might not be your department that's doing something, but on next week's Sabbath, we'd like all of our heads of department to be present as we say our farewell to Pastor and his family. Now, I'm not going to go over um, everything about why we are comfortable this morning. Just like the church to know that by the grace of God and through the prayers of his children, we're able to have the AC going today. Now what we want you to do is to enjoy the blessedness of this day in worship before God. This afternoon, right after service, we'll be celebrating with our students, graduates, those who through their resilience and conscious vigilance are made recipients of a happy ending in the milestones of their academic life. We will join the education department in congratulating them and their parents and other family members downstairs right after worship this afternoon. May I also share with you that our pastor is vacationing with his family as of the first of this month. Let us continue to keep Pastor Dowding and his family in our prayers. In our midst are some visitors, and it's my 
happy privilege to welcome them into our midst. We have Chernell Robinson. Chernell, if you're here, would you just raise your hands? There she is. Good to have you. And is that your family with you, Chernell? We praise God for Chernell Robinson and her family. Let the church say amen. amen. Then we have May Matt Matledge or Matledge. Oh, hi. Welcome. You know, I saw the two little girls walked in this morning, and we welcomed them inside. And shortly thereafter, I saw a lady come running. And I said to her, I'm sorry, but we took your children. She looked at me. She smiled. Because I believe she's saying, well, they're in good hands. Praise God. We're happy to have you today. Lisa and Stacy, that's your names? Great. Good to have you. Then we have my, my Grace Burrows. Sister Burrows. Where's, where's Sister Burrows? Praise God. Sister Burrows, if you don't mind, I'm just going to share with the church what, what occurred to us last week, right? <laughs> you know, last Sabbath morning, we were at camp meeting, so there was not a formal setting here for church. But um, we decided that we would still have the church door open for those who might want to come in and worship with us. So we were sitting in our car, it's sad because it was just the two of us, my wife and I, that is. And we were saying, well, maybe no one else is coming. I said, no, somebody else will come. We're going to go inside, we're going to set up and wait for them to come. But before we could do that, a black car drove in here. It went by the back and then it reversed. And we saw the car driving through and I was like, oh no, don't tell me somebody came and because they didn't see an, um, other cars in here, they're leaving. But then the Holy Spirit intercepted that vehicle and stopped it in its tracks. And it reversed to where I was parked and the window rolled down in the back, so I'm saying this must be a very important person. Sure enough, it was, because their sister Bowers said to us, oh, is there no church today? I said, sure there is church, my sister. And she happily got out of the car, and we came inside here. And what a wonderful time we had, sister Bowers. Sister Bowers is visiting all the way from the Bahamas. But she wanted to be in church last week, and thank God we were there to facilitate that. We welcome you again, and as we begin our divine worship service today, it is my sincere prayer that the Holy Spirit will hover over each one of us, and our hearts will be transported from earth to heaven above. God bless you. You are acquainted with all my ways, and that should not scare you, but that should reassure you that you serve a God that knows you and loves you. David says, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. On me, 
I wish I had an amen for that. David says that God has hedged us around. God has put a circle around you so that the enemy can't touch you. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. Jumping ahead to verse 13 and 14, the last ones, he says, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. <laughs> you know the word is struggling with Roe versus Wade. The Bible says, David says, speaking about a God that loves us, he says, you covered me. While I was in my mother's womb. So that hedge that he spoke about happens even from within yes. your mother's womb. He says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> I praise you, God, for I am fearful and wonderfully made. Marvelous are you. Your works. This is our call to worship. Bow your heads with me. Father, into this place we invite your presence. And we thank you, o God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We thank you, o Lord, that you hedged us around. We thank you that even while we are in our mother's womb, you knew us and you loved us. We invite you into this place. We invite you into this presence. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Sabbath, everyone. Let me try that again. Let me just test the room. Shall we praise the Lord? If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, can we just put our hands together? Hallelujah. God is great and greatly to be praised. We're getting ready to sing our opening hymn. It's on 524. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We can stand on our feet all over the room. Hallelujah. So sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the Seth, the Lord, Jesus, Jesus. Give more. 
we put our hands together? Hallelujah. So I'm going to need y'all to talk back to me this morning. Is that all right? Hallelujah. We're here to we're here to praise him this morning. Is that what we came here to do? I just want to make sure I'm in the right house. And we come here to give him glory this morning. Hallelujah. This song says that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid of? Hallelujah.
the, the, the God that I read the scripture, he said that we're fearfully and wonderfully, and we're wonderfully made. That means that God, he knows our inner parts. He made our insides. Literally, so he knows us to the core. And what an honor that he knows us. Hallelujah.
the light behind the clouds. That light is doing a work on your behalf. That sun is doing a work on your behalf. That sun is causing the process of precipitation. That the clouds may eventually bring forth showers of blessings. Look at the light. right now, but I want to let you know that all storms eventually run out of rain. Look at the light behind your clouds. There you will find the son of righteousness who will arise with healing in his way. Jesus is on top of things for you. I don't know what it is, but I can tell you that Jesus is on top of things for you. He knows your name. So even now we are privileged to be able to speak to the Father for his Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. So if you would kneel with me, then let us pray to our Father which are in heaven, who is the light behind your clouds. Oh, Father, our Father in heaven, we're thankful that you know our name. While we'll allow the world to call us whatever and we will live by names outside of our name that you've given to us, you know our name. While we go out and about making a mess of ourselves, you know our name and you call us by that name. Father, while many of us, we may not even know ourselves, you know us, you love us, and you care very deeply for us. Thank you, God, for knowing our name. Father, this morning we come before your throne asking for Jesus. Because it's him that we need above all things, even now. Father, we are desperately in need for your healing love, your forgiving love your soothing spirit. And so on this morning, God, we ask for the fresh baptism of your Holy Spirit in our hearts today. Father, many of us have come here this morning with aches and pains, with challenges, with difficulties, whether it be financial, whether it be familial, whether it be marital, whether it be with work. God, you know every detail of our life. You even numbered the hairs on our head. You know the ones that bother us, the ones that may be discoloring, the, the ones that other people may think are not a big deal, but they do affect us, God. You know the things that bother us the most and you care. God, thank you for caring about us. Father, of those things, we ask, Lord, that you may deliver us. And if you see it fit that we remain in that crucible, we ask that you may strengthen us. God, and if our minds be wandering out and about seeking for other answers, Lord, help us remember that your grace is sufficient for us. Lord, thank you for your grace. Give us a heart that, that recognizes the power of your grace and its work in our lives and in our hearts. Father, heal our sin-sick souls. We need you. That family, Lord, that is going through so much turmoil, God, we know that you are the wonderful counselor. Lord, I pray that you would bring counsel to them, thoughts that would change their minds, that would heal the, the wounds and the broken hearts, God. Lord, we ask that you may inspire them to hear men or women, or those who have been given the tongue of the learned, to give them a word in due season that would turn things around in their life. Lord, for the students that 
may be struggling through school, God, I ask that you may increase their intelligence. You want us to be the head and not the tail. God, this is not for our sake, but we ask this for your sake, that your glory may be revealed through our intelligence and through how you use us, whether we're in the workplace or whether we're in school, God. Lord, we would reveal your glory under all circumstances, but you know our frame. You know that we are but dust. And God, because of that, you must do something on our behalf. The students don't just want to pass in school. They want to excel. Folks don't want to just do well at work, but they want to excel. They want to grow. They want to get to new heights in order to continue to, 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 to share more of you wherever it is that, that, that they might find themselves. People need you, God. And we will be used by you in all departments, in all the areas of this world, because things we see are quickly wrapping up. Statements are making bad decisions. Some are making apparently good decisions that have a bad end. Lord, we understand and we've read the prophecies. We see them, God. But we would not just have intelligence and understand the prophecies and the this and the that and all the doctrines. Lord, we want to be Christians in our hearts. Lord, help us to truly be Christians in our hearts today. We want to stop asking for toys, cars, and candy. God, we need a change in our hearts today. We understand the work that you're doing in the most holy place even now. The work of cleansing the temple. God, cleanse our soul temples of ourself so that it may be Christ and Christ alone that is revealed at all times. That when the world looks at us, that, that Jesus may be suggested. Lord, that your glory may be revealed in us. Father, I close here, but I know that there are so, there are so many vicissitudes in all of our lives that, that I can't name from here. But that your people may know that you know every detail of everything that they're going through. That you are on top of things. We're thankful, God, that you're on top of our clouds and that you would heat them up to pour out showers of blessings over our lives. Give us the faith of Jesus so that we can just wait a little while longer as your spirit continues to linger with us and do his work. Help us to know that your grace is sufficient for us precious and most holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Worship God in our singing. Can you say amen? And we have worshiped God in our praying. And the time has come because we know that the, one of the songs told us that God is, is a good God. He keeps blessing us. And this morning, I want to challenge all of us to put God first. I know it can be difficult to put God first. Do I have a weakness? The, the Laodicean church, the Bible says, yet they love God, but they had a problem putting God first. This morning, I want to challenge us to put God first because he has been mighty good to us. And so we want to worship him with our tithes and our offering. You see, brothers and sisters, God has no hands but ours, no feet but ours. And as we give back what God has given us, we are becoming agent in helping others to know Christ, who is to know 
is life eternal. Can you say amen? So let us give, not grudgingly, but give with a heart of gratitude for what God has done. Shall we pray? Loving Father and our God, I want to thank you for blessing us beyond measure. And as we return what is rightfully you, yours, we ask that we'll use it to bring honor and glory to your name, that many will come to know Christ, who is to know is life eternal. Above all, when you shall come, save us. Save us, we pray, in the precious and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. worship God. We worship God in our giving. We return 10% of our income. We give faithfully and joyfully back to God. Our offerings pour from our hearts of gratitude and love to our Lord and Savior. We have four ways of giving. You may use the Adventist giving application. You may use the Zelle application in your bank account. You may write a check to the first SDA Church of White Plains and mail it in to the address on the screen. And finally, you may make arrangements to pick up or drop off your cash. Contact our Treasury staff. Your local church benefits from all the offerings you give. We are grateful to you for your support. Thanks for choosing our ways of giving. May God bless you always. Boys and girls, today we are going to talk about a story in the Bible about Jesus giving living water. Have you ever heard of living water? What, which brand of water do you drink? Poland Spring, anybody? Essentia? Dasani? Kirkland? Even tap water? Okay. There are many different ones, but after a while, don't you feel thirsty after drinking? In the Bible, it says that Jesus was leaving a city to go to a place called Galilee. In order to get to that city, though, he needed to pass through Samaria. During his travel through Samaria, Jesus was both hungry and thirsty. His disciples had gone into the village to get some food. Jesus decided to rest by a well. A woman was walking toward that well to fetch some water. Jesus then asked her if 
she could get him something to drink. The woman was surprised because Jesus was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans would never talk to each other. The woman asked him, why are you talking to me? You know that I am a Samaritan. Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for water and I would give you living water. The woman was confused. Jesus was at the well with no bucket to even get water. She asked Jesus where he would get this living water. Jesus responded, when you drink this well water, you will become thirsty again. But anyone who drinks of the water I give will never thirst again. The woman asked Jesus to give her this water so she won't have to continue coming to this well. Jesus said, go get your husband. I don't have a husband, she said. You have spoken the truth, Jesus said. And the person you live with now is still not your husband. The woman was shocked that Jesus knew this. So she asked, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist, insist on Jerusalem being the only place to worship God? Jesus told her, there will come a day when it will not matter where you worship God. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am the Messiah, Jesus replied. The woman ran back to the village and told her people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Many people from the village came to see Jesus, and he was able to speak to them. The people told the woman, we believe not only because of what you said, but we have heard for ourselves and know that this man truly is the Messiah. Amen. The water that Jesus was speaking about wasn't a never-ending stream that magically refilled. It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to anyone who comes to Jesus by faith, and we can receive Jesus and worship him no matter where we are. Amen. Let's pray and ask God to give us the Holy Spirit today. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking all of us up to see another day. Please allow us to receive the Holy Spirit and allow us not to thirst for the things of this world, but to only focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, church. Afternoon, church. Just before I speak with regards to our speaker this morning, I'd like to say welcome to some individuals who came in after we had formally welcomed you. And in our midst is our former pastor, well beloved, one who has done many things for a number of us in this church. Amen. 
And it would be remiss of me if I did not do what I'm doing right now. And Pastor Jones, we just want to give you the flowers today. I want to thank you for taking mom to church today also. Amen. You know, when you were growing up, it was the other way around, right? She took you to church. All right. Today you're taking her to church. We thank God for having been with Sister Iris Price through all this swell. And um, Pastor, you're doing a wonderful job with her. We just want to thank you. Amen. Then there are others who have come in after that. Um, I'm not exactly sure of everybody, but whoever you are, I just want to let you know that you're welcome to our worship today. Let the church say... Amen. 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 Now I stand to share with you a few words about a gentleman that I've come to know over the last several years. Someone who has distinguished himself as somebody that you can speak to at any time. Amen. He's a gentleman who recognizes that as a servant of God, he is available to be used. Amen. And whenever time you ask Elder Richardson to do something, he always consents without murmuring. Today we have the privilege of hearing him speak to us in our midday service. We have heard him on Wednesday night prayer meetings or in other settings. But today he comes to us from the desk, the pulpit. And we just want to let you know that we welcome you to the pulpit. Ella Richardson, we look forward to what God has laid upon your heart. Yes, so church, right after the praise team or the, um, the song of meditation, the next voice you will hear is that of our elder, beloved brother, Brother Ivor Richardson. Amen. Sorry, I forgot. Um, next week Sunday this is just for the seniors okay next week Sunday there will be a seniors banquet and you're invited to be part of it speak to Elder, Elder Alvaranga or myself or Sister Gordon as to how you can be part of the seniors banquet next week Sunday thank you
out of my life. Thanking our first elder, Robert Webb, all the elders of the Board of Elders, all the leaders of the church, all the members of the church, thank you for receiving me this morning. God has laid a message on my heart entitled, Led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. Let us pray. God, we pause through this brief prayer. Recognizing unless you build a house, oh God, those of us who labor in the house labor in vain. And so, Lord, we recognize we have no other help but you. The psalmist says, who shall we turn to? You are the only help. I look to the hills. Oh, where's come my help? My help comes from the Lord who has made heaven and earth. Lord, we pray that this moment, this brief preaching moment, you'll humble our spirits. Quiet our minds for a little bit, oh God, so we can concentrate and focus on your word. Sometimes, Lord, your word is a hard word. Sometimes your word is an easy word. Sometimes your word challenges us in ways that we're not comfortable. It causes us to move out of our comfort zone. But that's what you call us to, Lord. You're calling us to do battle with you. You're calling us into spiritual warfare. You're calling us to present ourselves and to be led by your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, take away our worries. May we leave them at the feet of Jesus. If we're wise, we'll leave them there. But some of us are inclined to pick up our problems. We believe in pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Not recognize that you are the Savior. And you know how to solve our problems. You know how to address our need better than any entity any, or any other force in this life and all the next. And so, Lord, break up the stoniness of our heart because we become hard from the difficulties of life. Our routines are not easy. And so give us a heart of flesh, one which is fertile, where the seed of the word can germinate, take root, and grow. So like the, the psalm, you can say, that word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Help us have teachable spirits for this brief moment, oh God, because if we don't have teachable spirits, we can't be taught a thing. And if we're not teachable, you can't lead us through your Holy Spirit as you led your son, Jesus. Bless us now and help us to concentrate your word and to glean something from this word that helps us grow closer to you. This we ask your son, Jesus. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. I know this is a high-tech church, and so if you don't have a Bible, feel free to pull up your iPad, even your cell phone, go to Google, and type in the scripture. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, uh, Isaiah 61. I'll read a few verses. We'll be reading from verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 61, starting at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give all garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall bind up the ancient ruins. I'm sorry, they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former de devastations. They shall repair, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flock. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall call, be, be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations 
and in their riches you shall glory, because their shame was doubled, and dishonor was proclaimed to their lot. Therefore, they shall possess a double portion, everlasting joy shall be theirs. May the Lord add a reading to his holy word. Before I get started, I'm reminded of a colleague who gave me a little joke. It's meant as a joke. And so there was an old preacher who was preaching in a church for many years. And the old preacher died. And of course, it was time for a new preacher to come. We should identify with that because we have a system where every four or five years, our pastors may be called away as we find ourselves today with our Dr. Dowding being called away. And so when the new pastor came, he was long-winded, much like I am, but I promise not to be long-winded today. <laughs> and so the member said to him, Pastor, we don't mind you preaching for a long time. You can preach long, but don't learn us anything new. And so I say that because God has given me a teaching spirit. I'm also a teacher, which some of you know. And so that's the spirit he's given me. But I've had members say to my face, Pastor, we don't like when you do those teaching sermons. And so I'm just giving you a forewarning that it's a little bit of a teaching sermon this morning, but I promise I won't teach the whole sermon. <laughs> I promise that the Bible tells me that because of lack of vision, the people perish. It also says because of a lack of knowledge, the people perish. And, and so it's good for your pastor to teach sometimes. And so it's very discouraging when you say to your pastor, don't teach. But I've had to heed that because I'm saying to God, if they're saying that to me, there's something to it. But I want to do a little teaching about this passage. Now, pastors like to use this passage because we believe what? God has anointed us to preach the gospel. And I'm guilty of using this passage, but this passage is not truly about us. Isaiah is considered what? One of the major prophets. If you're a Bible scholar, you'll know that. Isaiah is a major prophet, and so in the Old Testament we have major prophets and we have minor prophets. And so it's not an indication of how brilliant they are or how prophetic they are or how holy they are. It's simply the length of the books. If the books are long and long-winded, they're major prophets. And so if the books are short, they're minor prophets. So I don't want you to think it's anything mysterious. That's all it is. But this is a foreshadowing of an event that's going to come. Now, if you're a good student of English, and that, that tells you how old school I am, because today the students don't say English. What do they say? ELA. But ELA means English language arts. So if you say English, we know your age. It means you're old. <laughs> and if you say ELA, you're a more modern student, because the modern students, they'll say, my ELA class. You'll never hear them say, my English class. But old school, it was simply English. And so foreshadowing, this is a foreshadowing event. Foreshadowing for those of you who are uh, scholars uh, and know your literary elements, like what's a metaphor? You know, what's a noun? What's a verb? What's hyperbole? Etc. And so foreshadowing is an indication of something. It's a symbol or a story that tells you that something is coming later on. And so to see what that something is, let's turn to the Gospel of Luke. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4. And we're going to start around verse 16. And so in Luke chapter 4, starting around verse 16, it says, When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up and read the scroll of the prophets of Isaiah, which was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Verse 18 tells you, same passage if, you can pay, if you've been paying attention. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's 
favor. I'll stop there. And so this is a foreshadowing. In the Old Testament, God used Isaiah to set the foreshadowing of this event that Luke records that Christ himself is proclaiming. And so as scholars debate and fuss about whether or not Isaiah was, the passage Isaiah was referring to Isaiah, Jesus is demonstrating here that it was a foreshadowing not only of Isaiah, but of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would come later and fulfill the prophecy that Isaiah set in Isaiah 61. And so that tells us something, that God is a true prophet. You see, the thing about the truth prophet and the false prophet is that the false prophet is going to tell you something that might never happen. Never happen. Fable. But God's word and God's prophets are true, and they must come to pass. If you study your Bible, you know that what God says, you can depend on. God is dependable. God is trustworthy. God is worthy of praise. Yes, he is. And so if you've been walking with God a while, you know that this is true. The songwriter gets it right when he says what? Oh, master, let me walk with thee in lowly parts of service tree. Tell me thy secrets. Help me bear the strain of toil of life or the fret of care. And so I love songwriters because they get the gospel in a nutshell. Then they're not long-winded. And so Jesus proclaiming that I am the Messiah and that what? the God has sent me to do has been prophesied long ago by the old prophet Isaiah and now it's coming to pass where Luke the physician in the gospel of Luke can record the same passage now God calls us what to service and he calls us to what worship and so how do we worship well Paul has a remedy for that or prescription for that in Romans 12, 1, Paul tells the Roman church, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you brought, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is no big thing, guys. It's just your reasonable service. Don't get big-headed or swell-headed or think I'm some kind of super Christian. Paul says that's just your reasonable, basic service. And so he's telling you how to serve God. Because if you don't understand that you have to worship God or you have to serve God, then you are just pretending to be a Christian. And if the COVID pandemic had taught us anything as a church, is that we can't waste time. We can't fool around with this gospel. Some of us have been what, sitting on this gospel far too long. And the pandemic came and took our loved ones and we are crushed. But God is sending us a message. What does the scripture say? Now is the what? Appointed time to accept the Lord. Now is the appointed time to accept Jesus. Amen. And so our lives must reflect that God is holy. God is wise. God is merciful. God is all powerful. And that if God is in us, then what? Who can be against us? Amen. Scripture tells what? No weapon form against God's children shall what? Prosper. And so why do we live defeated lives as Christians? We live sometimes as we're so defeated, we don't understand that God has put a hedge of protection around us as Elder Alvarango was explaining when he was uh, up giving the call to worship. You're protected and you're empowered. And so don't listen when the devil comes and says, be afraid. Because the scripture tells us what? God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but what? Of power and of love and of a what? Sound mind. And I hear you repeating it so the good uh, scholars in the audience know their scripture and they've experienced it. They've experienced God, what? Walking with them and talking with them, empowering them, energizing them. And so that's why we keep coming. Because we serve a, girl, a, a holy God who what? Can deliver can deliver us from trouble, 
When you're between a rock and a hard place, but can also deliver blessing, can also deliver might, can also pour his spirit on the earth so that not only the Christians will prophesy, but that men and women who are outside of God's grace because they haven't accepted Christ as Savior can see the power and acknowledge their sin and recognize what? The need for Savior. And I'm so glad that Isaac, Isaac, it's good to see you, uh, used that scripture. It was a confirmation because I didn't even bother to read it because it was in my sermon today. But that's how God works. When he did that, it verified for me that God is involved in our word today. God is involved in our message today. God is holy. God is righteous. And God is seeking to bless us and use us. And so we have to be sensitive to his call. When God asked the woman at the well for the drink of water, she didn't recognize who God was. She didn't recognize him at all. In fact, she tried to tell Jesus, what's wrong with you? Don't you see I'm a Samaritan woman? And I recognize that you are what? A Nazarite or a Nazarene. Because that's where Christ grew up, was a Nazarene or Nazarite. He said, don't you, she said to him, this is Jesus she's talking to now. She, and you know, and some, some of us are like that too, because sometimes some of us talk to God like we don't know who God is. We're disrespectful. We're questioning God. We're acting as though we're more stronger than God. Instead of dropping our knees and pray, we're asking God, why did you do this to me? But she said to him, don't you know you're not supposed to have anything to do with me? That your people can sit on my people, what, unclean? Shame on you. That's what she told Jesus. And Jesus said to her, if you knew who was asking you for a drink of water. You would have gladly given it to me because you come to this well where Abraham and your ancestors used to come and get water, but you have to keep coming because you get thirsty ever so often. And so every time you get thirsty, you've what? got to come to this well to drink. But I've got a different kind of water for you. This is a living water from the living rivers that is spiritual, that if you drink this water, if I give you a little bit of this water, you'll never thirst again. Don't we want that water? Because we get tired of being thirsty. You know, sometimes, so, I know some of us like love food. And there's an old adage that says there are two kind of people when it comes to what? Food. There are those who what? Live to eat. They like eating. They eat anything and everything. You know, my wife used to get on me, and now that I'm old, I appreciate it. <laughs> she says, Ivor, you can't eat everything there is. Some things are what? not good for you. <laughs> she says, why don't you just try eating some vegetables alone sometimes? <laughs> Forget the meat. And I said, no, Marion, I need a little bit of meat. <laughs> but she's right. When you eat vegetables alone sometimes, you feel a whole lot better, a whole lot healthier. Your mind gets a little bit clearer. You can focus on the word. You can go into what? Your prayer closet and pray. Or if you don't have a cl prayer closet, whatever room you're praying or space you're praying, get to that space and pray. You ever wake up in the middle of the night and wonder where you can't sleep? If that's ever happened to you, get up and pray. It's God waking you up to have fellowship with him. There's no such thing as a restless night. If your eyes all of a sudden pop open and it's only like 2 a.m. in the morning and you don't want to get up before 6, get up and pray. God is trying to tell you something. And so God says something very profound to the lady. And I want to say to you today, receive it in the way it's meant. Because you know that Jesus was what, 100% human. But at the same time, he was what, 100% God. Because he what, was always led by the Spirit of God. See, Jesus submitted, submitted himself to be submissive under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, and God his Father, to obedience. And, and so that's why he was able to pick up the scrolls and read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Let me just back up a little bit. Do you know how old Jesus was when he read that scroll? Scholars agree that he was what we call a preteen. If you're not sure what a preteen is, it's when you get to the double numbers, 10, 11, 12. Those are the preteen years. 
Why? Because when you get to 13, you become a teenager. <laughs> and so that's a little bit different. <laughs> so, so he was about 12 years old. And, and so Jesus was trying to relay something. And, and so when he read this portion of scripture, it says that he said something that the people didn't agree with. He said, today in your hearing, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. And they looked around and said, isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? What is he talking about? Because they didn't discern that he was a master, he was a prophecy. The Spirit of God had moved him to get up and say, start your ministry, because that's why, you know, I had you from virgin birth be born and be ready to what? Proclaim this gospel. And so they were so angry, they were looking for him to what? Stone him and kill him. And the scripture says that God cloaked him. Now, if you know what a cloak, God covered him in a way that he couldn't see him. And so he walked right out. And his parents who came back to look for him and said, why were you missing? And he said to them, don't you know, I have to be about what? About my father's business. But I want to say something about youth and the way we treat youth. And, and so this was a shameful way that the, the priests and the prophets and the apostles that were all gathered in the synagogue and the members just treated him with disrespect. Sometimes we talk to teenagers and young people disrespectfully because we think they're young. But think of what the scripture says about children. God says what? A little child shall lead them. And then when his disciples, the 12, tried to stop them from coming to Jesus, he said, suffer the little ones not to come unto me, for of such is what? The kingdom of heaven. But see, because Jesus was 100% human, he was discouraged by the reaction of those in the synagogue. So much discouraged that Jesus would go back home and sit down from age 12 till age 30 before he got up again. But he was doing something important. I remember when I started ministry, I thought about going to New York Theological Semin Seminary and, and uh, Eleanor Moody Shepherd, uh, Dr. Moody Shepherd, who is a great Presbyterian pastor, is also the dean of that seminary. And she says to me, Ivor, that's my first name, if you don't know. She says, listen, you've got a great smile and you're charming. But she says, you can't lead God's people with your smile and charm. She says, you have to go and sit. I want you to sit for years. Even when you graduate, don't go to ministry right away. She says, you have to what? Prepare for God's people. And so I took her advice. I didn't go to the seminary. I hope she doesn't think that's a slight on her. I went to Union and Auburn <laughs> instead. But I heard what she said, and she was right. And so Jesus, although he was discouraged, used those years to prepare for when he would start his ministry at age 30. So I want to say, be careful you talk to young people. Don't discourage them. And, and even though they're young, respect them. And I'll tell you something. If you show them respect, they'll show you respect too. Because I teach, I know that. Students follow me around and sometimes want to come to my class even though they're not members of my class. I said, no, go to your class. Stop following me. But they recognize that there's something about me that I'm kind to them. I'm caring. I listen to their little problems. I don't pray with them because I don't want to fall fall of don't mix the church and state. But we, if they're in a Christian club, I can talk to them there. And I can talk to the teachers who come to the Christian club too because we're Christians. But I just want to say, be careful you talk to you. Don't discourage them. Encourage them because God says they're capable of leadership. And when Christ tried to lead, they shut him down. But he was able to prepare for the people. And when he was 30, he was ready. They couldn't stop him now. No matter what they said. Because God had empowered him. He was on the march for God. And so there was no stopping his ministry. Of course, they just tried to stop him on the cross, but they didn't understand that too was a fulfillment of God's prophecy. Paul tells what the Romans that what? While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so recognize that your being saved is nothing that you've done. It's not by works. 
There's nothing you can do. It's God's unmerited favor that he saved you. And so long before we knew who God was, or we could really love God, God prepared with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and went to cross, would suffer the indignity of being crucified, would go to hell, conquer hell and the grave and death. And when he rose, he was able to say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Because Christ has overcome even death, the last enemy. It's strange that we're still afraid of death. I always tell my wife, listen, I'm far more afraid of getting old than dying. <laughs> because this getting old, the fingers get stiff. The knee hurts. See, I'm the kind of person, although I'm not driven, driven, but if I'm not active, I feel like I'm dead. I've got to be doing something. I've got to move. See, I've got to move. See, this body is designed for what? Movement. Yes. If you stay one place too long, you're going to get sick. Yes. You get atrophied, atrophy, everything gets stiff, the muscles, the bones. Before you know it, you're a cripple. I'm always telling my wife, push through her pain. Don't become a cripple. I tell that all the time. She thinks I'm crazy. But, but I keep telling her, don't give in to the pain. See, because pain sometimes, you need to know, is what? A state of mind. Don't you know the devil uses pain to keep you complacent, keep you home, keep you from worshiping, keep you from what? Serving God. And, and so if you're paying any attention to these scriptures we read this morning, you see that God wants, wants you to run, rebuild cities, reach people for the kingdom. And, and so we're very good with what I call lip service. We say, Lord, I'll go anywhere you'll send me. Lord, here I am. Send me. And when God says, come, we say, oh, Lord, you know, can I come later? Remember when God called the man and he said, Christ, I want to serve you. But he said, what? Let me first bury my father. And then I'll come after I bury my father. And Christ says to him, look, let the dead bury the dead. In other words, let those who are spiritually dead take care of him. But I'm on a mission. In three years, I'll be crucified. We'll be no longer here. I know you don't know that. But my word is important. Come right away and attend to my word. And, and so I'm going to revert back to the one at the well. She said to him, let me go home and tell my husband. And Christ says, which husband? <laughs> You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with? It's not your husband. And she says, you must be a prophet. How did you know that? Because you don't know me. She recognized he was a prophet. And so there's a question in that. Is the man you're living with your legal husband? And husbands don't think that I'll let you off the hook. Is the woman you're living with your legal wife? And let me tell you, that's important to God. God, one of the first miracles he did was turning water into wine at a wedding. See, God instituted the sacrament of marriage. And let me tell you this, too. It may sound old-fashioned. Marriage is between a man and a woman. I don't care that we live in America. I don't care that we have a lot of gay and lesbians and GBQ. That's fine. But that doesn't change what God has established marriage as. It's between a man and a woman. It says a man should leave his mother and father and cling unto his wife and the two shall become one flesh spiritually because we never become one physically but spiritually we become one flesh and, and so a lot of people like to say this is my wife but they've never been married or this is my husband but they've never been married young people today like to shack up they think it's alright to what? try it over first before we get married we need to know what, if the shoe fits, or whatever description you want to use. <laughs> but God is dishonored with that. Because remember what Paul told the Romans? To be what? Zent your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, accept to God with your reasonable service. The scripture also tells us, for those who read and know it, that what? God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. See, you can't be untruthful with God. John tells us that when Christ was born, Christ was a prophet that's full of what? Grace and truth. 
If you're a liar, God can't work with you. God is looking for those who will tell the truth. Whose truth? Your own truth of who you are. But also, more importantly, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's God's truth, not our truth. We like to construct many truths, and we like to construct what alternative families and things that God will bless them. But when we run afoul of God's law, we should not expect a blessing. Because God is what? Not to be toyed with. God is not to be played with. Although God is compassionate and he's full of grace and mercy, he also has standards. And so the scripture teaches me that God is looking what? To reap a harvest of righteousness. Do you know what righteousness means? The scripture says that we don't have it. It says all our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. That's what God sees when he looks at our righteousness. And he says all our wisdom is like folly. And so God had, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit had to cloak Jesus in humanity. Send him 42 generations down to earth to what? Be our elder brother. And to show us how to live this victorious life. See, God is calling us. And if we haven't presented ourselves, God is not going to be able to use us. When the disciples came to Jesus and says, what is the greatest commandment? Because Jesus knows they were arguing about what is the greatest commandment. And he says, guys, fellas, disciples, prophets, apostles, you're arguing about what is the greatest commandment. He says, I know you see ten commandments, but there really is only two. He says the first is what? Love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And what? Him only shall you serve for I'm a jealous God. See, God doesn't want to share us with the devil or the world. God wants to use for his kingdom and glory. And so you have to ask the question, who are you? And Paul tells us that too. He says what? You're a peculiar people. That means you're strange to the world. And you're strange to the world because God says that you're in the world, but you're not of the world. This place is not your home. And I think of my, one of my granddaughters when I say that. So my granddaughter, Ailey, like my wife, is very sensitive. That means cries easy. And, and, and so I told her one day, you know, when grandpa's dead and gone, I want you to be able to stand up. I want you to know the gospel. I want you to be instrumental in the church. I want you to use your music in the church. I want you to be able to be in position to bless people. I look at her, she's crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, Grandpa, I don't want you to die. Don't die and leave me, Grandpa. That's very sad. And I realized that she's so upset, I had to stop the conversation. But I said to her, listen, I know it's hard for you to understand. And she was really young then. She's now 14. But she still doesn't deal with it well. I said, but... Once you're born, it's appointed once a man or woman to what? Be born. By God's grace to live, what, some three scores. A score is 20. Three times 20 is what, 60. Plus 10, that's 70. So God has only guaranteed you 70 years if you don't die from an accident or mishap. But God says also, if you live a clean Christian life and you serve me and you don't drink booze and you don't smoke, and you don't take all those things that corrupt your body, by reason of strength, you can live to maybe another 10, 80, 90, or 100. We don't live much beyond 110, guys. Let's face it these days. We see in the Bible, some prophets live, live to 900 years. No such luck. <laughs> if you're about 110, it's about time to go. And so it behoves you that the scripture says what? Now is the appointed time. Get right with God. Don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till you're 110. And say, I'm going to accept the Lord. You've wasted all your good years. One thing I learned from the age five in vacation Bible school, give up your best to the master. Give him the strength of the youth. Join in salvation, strong army. Join in the battle for truth. Those little lessons are important. At five years old, we don't realize fully what we're saying. But as we get bigger, we realize that the, the BBS teachers and the Sunday school teachers had our best interests at heart. Yes. And, and so Paul is calling us to do something he told the Ephesians to do. Tell me to Ephesians chapter 6. Promises to be my last scripture. Ephesians chapter 6. Stand about verse 10. 
See, God calls us to spiritual battle. And if you're going to do spiritual battle, you have to be what? Ready. You've got to be prepared. And, and so in this passage of Ephesians 6, starting about verse 10, Paul tells the Ephesians that because God called you to do spiritual battle, you have to put on what? The whole armor of God. And so verse 10 tells us, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Place your fingers right there. And so Paul tells them why they need to put on this armor. Because you're going to do spiritual battle. See, God is willing to lead you into battle, but you have to do what? Your part to prepare. So how do you prepare for God? You prepare first by what? Developing a prayer life. I meet too many Christians that tell me, Pastor, I can't pray. What? Are you crazy? You're a Christian who can't pray. You're in trouble. You're wide open to the devil. You better learn to talk to God. Prayer, listen. Prayer, I'm going to share something that I didn't really want to share, but I'm going to share something with you. Prayer is simply talking to God. So listen, when I was a teenager, I grew up in the mean streets of Brooklyn. That's where my mom emigrated to. And I lived some 24 years in Brooklyn. And so when I'm young, you know, like all young people of the age, we like to what, go to a party because we don't know parties are dangerous. My mom always told us, I don't want you to go to parties. And we were saying, the old lady, that's what we used to call my mom when we want to hear what she's saying. We say, the old lady doesn't know what she's talking about. And sometimes she's talking, blah, blah. And we say, is that old lady still talking? <laughs> because we're hard-headed. We don't get it. But my mom would be up and she always says to me, I know when you come home. I don't think you guys know. I know when you sneak into 3 o'clock, 2.30, 4 o'clock. I heard every one of you. Because not only are you walking hard and making noise, you're talking. But she says, I'm not sleeping. I'm on my knees praying for you. By name, she was praying. I've heard her pray. Because one time I was passing by, she didn't know I was passing by in the house on her floor. And she said, that boy, Ivor, laughs too much, giggles too much, too happy. Bless him, Lord and teach him, give him wisdom, so he'll know what to do. Well, don't you know one night I was coming from a party and I was coming by myself because my brother didn't want to go, William, and my cousin didn't want to go because we go together, so I went alone. And it was about three o'clock in the morning. And so I'm coming down Utica Avenue, I had to ride the train, I can't remember exactly where this party was, but I knew I had to get on the train, and I got off of Utica Avenue, and at that time of morning, I didn't have any more money for any more cabs, so I decided to walk about 15 blocks down Utica to Winthrop, where I lived. And so when I got a block from Winthrop on Utica, I saw like 12, 10 or 12 young men, they were walking in twos. And they walk like they're in the military, side by side, and they're walking. And, and so, I realized they were up to something, and I said, Ive, you gotta pray. But when you're frightened, you can't pray. <laughs> no, you can't. Thank God I was a member of my youth group, and Elder Thompson, God bless her, taught us many things. And so I knew I didn't have to come up with any fancy prayer. All I said was, Jesus, help me. That was my prayer. <laughs> Nothing else. And the way I said that, God knew that I was in trouble and I meant business. And so I stood up because I said, listen, I can't approach them. I could run across the street because cars are not coming that time in the morning. The street is clear. But I say, if I run across the street, they're going to know I'm afraid and they're going to run after me. So the Spirit says, no, stand your groan. He didn't speak in verbal, but God dropped into my head. Because I want you to know that God drops into your head things you need to know. I don't know if you believe that. I don't know if you have experienced that. But God dropped in my head, stand your groan. I'm telling you, I saw like a light go on. And I thought of God's word. Is what? A light onto your pot and a lamp onto your feet. And then God showed me there was a space right between them. Now, I don't know if there was a space thinking about it, no. But the light shone. And all I heard the voice says, walk in the light. So listen to this. You know, people say that things in the Bible are symbolic. I'm here to tell you that some of those things are real. 
God has allowed me to do some things and see some things. I can't share them because people think I'm crazy when I share them. But let me tell you how good God is. So I was obedient. See, God requires obedience. If you're obedient, God is going to deliver you. And so I walked in the light. And I realized I was in a space between them. And when I was in the middle of the 12th, I heard them say, where did he go? And I said, oh, they can't see me. I recognized that God had cloaked me. I was so shocked, but look, I knew my scripture. I kept still, I didn't cough, I didn't sneeze, because they wanted to know I'm in the middle of you. <laughs> and so they kept walking and said, where did he go? And, and so I walked to the end of Utica and Winthrop, and I see them like still going, and they still say, where did he go, where did he go? They can't see me. Amen. So I simply crossed Winthrop, the next street is 51st, I live one house in, I went inside, I'd never been to another party again. Amen. That was the end of my partying days because I recognized that God had delivered me and I might not be that lucky the next time somebody may shoot me or knife me. I said, God, I'm done. And so let me talk to the young people because I hope that you older folks are not still partying. Our partying days should be behind us. But listen, young people, you need to know that everywhere you go is ruled by a spirit. Yes, it is. And so when you go to a party, it's ruled by a stupid or silly spirit that says what? Jump, 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 jump. And you start, yeah, jumping. And you don't know why. And then after you jump and you sweat and you're tired, the spirit says, well, no, jump some more. Jump, jump. And you're jumping all night when you get home. You're tired. See, I used to go to parties because I like the party. At the party, what? I can get some food to eat, and really good food too. Get a nice drink, not alcohol, non-alcoholic, non nice drink. Talk to friends, get a dance with a nice girl, marry in close years. But <laughs> this is before I got married. I was single then, I hadn't met my wife then, so she doesn't have to worry about that. And, and so I enjoyed, one thing about me, I love a beautiful woman. And, and so at the party, I see a nice girl, and I ask her to dance. I was shy, but I wasn't shy about that. And so I'll ask her to dance, and we'll dance once or twice, and you know, then I'll go home. I didn't try to go home with her or anything like that. I went home. I was like 19 going to 20. And so I just got into high school. But God showed me, stop going to these things. And so we don't recognize that fools rush in where what? Angels dare to tread. Some places, as a Christian, young people, you ought not to go. It's the wrong spirit. There are places that have what? An evil or devilish spirit. And if you go in there, you may find yourself under evil spell, do something evil, and ruin your life. There's some places we ought not to go. I know that's a hard pill, young people, but I hope that you pray and ask God to what? give you wisdom. Because you need to know wisdom doesn't come automatically. Some people think wisdom comes with age and experience. No. You can be a 65 year old fool. Yes, you can. Wisdom comes only from God, and it comes only to do those who what? Ask him. And so if you've never asked God for wisdom, and you're here this morning, I'm here to tell you, you have none. You got zero. Solomon asked God for wisdom. God says, I'm so happy that you asked me for wisdom and not for riches and all that, that I'm not only going to make you wiser than any man before you, but I'll make you wiser than any man after you. God gave Solomon a special kind of wisdom, so much so that people said that Solomon was a magician and he was using black magic to do the things he did. No! He was using Holy Ghost power and God's anointing to do the things he did. If you read Chronicles chapter 7, it says that when... If my people, right, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, and pray, then I will hear from heaven and what? Heal their land. And so you want to know why the land doesn't have a healing? We're not praying enough, church. And I know that. Is Sister Desir here? Is well, she not here today? Okay. Sister Desir is looking for people to pray. And now, I hear that this church has 600 members on the books. And so I'm going to be conservative. 
let's cut that in half, 50%. So we have 300 members that are functioning when we can. In a church, my seven-day saints, of 300, we shouldn't have a problem finding people to pray. Something is wrong when we can't find people among 300 people to pray. Do you know your elders are overworked? Do you know your department heads are overworked? They're running two and three ministries because they can't what, find others to what, share the ministry with? And you tell me you're here to serve God? God doesn't want lip service. He wants those who are honest, those who would go, those he can depend upon, those he can trust, those who what? Put on the full armor and ready to do battle. And if you look at the armor, the first piece of the armor, God says what? Put the belt of truth around your waist. Read it when you go home. I'm not, not going to read it. I realize my time is gone. But he said put on the belt of truth around your waist. So if you're not going to be truthful, you're not ready for God. That's why... You need to speak the truth even when it's to your own detriment. Don't worry about that. God will bear you through. God calls us to speak the truth in and out. God calls us to be ready. God calls us to be able to pray. God calls us to be able to share the scripture with someone. God calls us to be able to comfort someone. God calls us to be lights of change in a world that's dark and dim and growing weary and silly and desperate and wicked. Yes, and so if the church, which is God's people, I have no doubt that you're God's people. That's why I'm with you. Wouldn't be here if you weren't God's people won't do what God calls us to do. Who are we waiting on? Can't ask the world outside these walls. They don't know what you're talking about. As Christ says that the world doesn't see him because they don't know him, they don't understand, but you see me because I'm in you and you are in me and the Father and the Holy Spirit are in all of us and together we're gonna to establish God's kingdom on earth. Let us pray with every head bow, every eyes closed. I don't know, I'm wondering if God spoke to you during this brief word. God says, be ready. I'm ready. I've been waiting. I've been knocking at your heart's door. In Revelation verse 3 and verse chapter 3 verse 20 says behold I stand at the door and knock if any man or woman hears my voice and opens the door I'll come in and sup with them and them with me and Mark tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel baptize them in the name of the Father in the name of the Son in the name of the Holy Spirit and teach them all that I've said to you and all you deserved and see me do. And so God is waiting to use us. I wonder if you, a word that you heard spoke to your heart and you recognize that you're in need of recommitting to Christ, to making yourself available. As every head is bowed and eyes closed, if that's your situation, just raise your hands. I see that hand, thank you. One of the, those who have been lax in prayer, have grown cold, have lost what I call some of your salt. God says that we are the salt of the earth. And if the salt loses its savor, it's no good. It's just gravel to be thrown down and to be trod on to the feet of men and women. You recognize that you've been a little lackluster. But you want to tell God, God, I want to correct that this morning. Raise your hands. Thank you. I see those hands. Maybe you've never accepted the Lord Jesus, even though you've been many years in the church. You've been coming as a guest. But you recognize this morning that you want to make a profession of faith and offer yourself to God. Raise your hand. raise their hands. And for those who raise their hands, I want to ask you to, and keep your heads bowed and eyes closed, guys. I don't want you to look at the people as they come up. I want you to make another step of faith. For those who raise your hands, get up out of your seat and make your way to the front. We 
want to pray with you this morning. I pray that you're bold enough to make your way down. The position is playing, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes, I'll trust you and obey. When the Spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. We thank God for this saint who has come forward, and I'm going to invite our first elder to come now and pray a prayer of recommitment with her. of the moment for Jesus is about to break upon the shores of our existence and unless we are prepared God then Father we shall find ourselves not ready when Jesus comes so Holy Spirit light divine shine thou upon these hearts of ours and bid us cast aside our fears our doubts and confess our sins so that victory can be ours through Jesus Christ let no one depart this room without pleading to be led by the Spirit of God Jesus, as your word go forth this afternoon, based upon the Bible, 
they shall not return unto you void. And so we thank you for being in this moment. We ask you now that you will seal our decisions that we have made with you and keep us faithful until the day when you shall come. This we humbly pray in the name of Jesus. Let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads and receive the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, be power, dominion, majesty, and might, both now and forevermore. Amen. when I gave um, the final welcome, I failed to recognize a daughter of this congregation. She was born right here in this church. Am I correct, Pastor? Chanel? There she is. Chanel returned this morning. We want to praise God. And thank you, Jesus. To the rest of the family, your husband and children, we just want to say how much we appreciate you joining us for worship today. We're looking forward to seeing you again. God bless you.